I welcome you to the video as I prepare to get a link to share on the Creality 3D website. We're going to be wrapping up the final stages of the assembly of all the parts and modifications we're doing on uh, Ender 5 Pro number three of three. Um, there was some work that wasn't done on camera. There's a note in the description about what work was not shown. Uh, you didn't really miss a whole lot. But anyhow, um, we're going to go ahead and pick it up where we left off and uh, go forward. Oh. So I'll get that link as I try and get Mr. Roboto there. Sorry, this part is not any fun for anybody to watch while I'm sitting there creating links and sharing them. All right, now that you've already been subject to a couple minutes of dead air, I still have one more task to pull off here. I don't know if he's going to join, but I'm going to send out a link to somebody to possibly join us. Just so I have somebody to talk to while I'm working, so it's not all white noise and you listening to the Sierra Tennis Pro that's running right behind me there. Okay, so that's been handled. We're going to start off by putting a TH3D sticker on here. I just got in another order from TH3D for my personal stuff, but I've already got enough TH3D stickers on my stuff, so we're going to tag this printer with the sticker. They all have the TH3D easy out sensor, which this one isn't mounted. That's part of what my final part is going to be, is putting the easy out wiring that I've already hooked up to the sensor that will ride up here. There's actually, these came with provided tubing. It's too much. I'm just going to use my tubing cutter to um, shorten that up a little bit. Put this in the material kit. All right, so first things first, let's go grab some zip ties out of here and I'll mount that easy mount, easy, easy out, run out sensor. And let's see. Oh. 
and let you guys see as much as you can. Oh, he did join in. Hello. Hey, hey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Okay. I'm taking my headphones off since you hopped in. I always have, I don't know about you, but I always like to have some white noise in the background while I'm working on a project because my brain just doesn't like having no, no input yeah. while I'm working on something. I got it's no fun. internet at the house, so I have to use the phone, so I wouldn't know how that would work. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, well, I, I, uh, you want to torture me, just give me, give me nothing to do and nothing to listen to, and that would drive me absolutely crazy right now i'm out in the easy out sensor from th3d they uh barely fit in the ender 5 pro case i don't know if you put one on the, the um, because it's a uh, an extension of the basically the serial connection between the screen and the board Mm -hmm. It comes out in height. Well, with the thickness of the thing, and even though it's pretty close to a surface mount, by the time you add that adapter and the height of the ribbon cable, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> it's almost twi almost twisting on the motherboard to close the case. But it fit. It's nothing's in danger of breaking or having problems or whatever. But it was a uh, it was a tight one. Yeah, I got that ball hitch on that Jazzy scooter last night, and it works. Oh, sweet! Yeah, yeah so, um, one of the one of the channels that I follow, he has a thing called Best Tugs, and they do those little they do what they call tug motors for moving airplanes around while they're not powered. Yeah, it's a lot of people think, oh, you can just fly it around, you know, use the engines to move around. But some of them won't even um, aren't even capable of firing without remote power and other things happening or whatever and so they need APU. Move, move by other forces <laughs> yeah you got to hook them up to an apu to get them started yep and this isn't i don't know the probably the best long-term solution i showed whatever out here so i put a couple of zip ties on there but this allows the run out sensor to be in the path between the filament spool and going in mm -hmm. um, i don't know if i'm going to come up with a printed solution for him or not i think that this is probably adequate my experience with these things are is really I could leave that zip tie off and you can just put it on the filament. When it runs out, it falls down. And you just feed the filament back through it when it um, when you reload it. The only reason for putting the zip ties on this one was just so it doesn't fall on the floor where you got to look for it or whatever yeah. when you come back to it. That's my thinking. And if he comes up with a better solution uh, that makes the present opportunity presents itself, I'll share what that is. But right now i think it'll be fine i don't know where you got the filament run out i i do use it on the machines that i have that have it but i still would rather not have a a run out happen during the middle of one of my prints if if i have my choice in the matter you know yeah run out sensors are annoying i hate the false positives yeah you get that and then also um if you run out mid mid layer and you know how it is a layer could be you know, on a tiny little part it's just a little bit or it could be a very big layer and if it's already like three quarters of the way through the layer it will resume back at that layer well it's going to print over material that was already there and it just doesn't make for a very clean interchange that's the part that i don't oh, really like. i didn't know that yeah. i thought it was doing right where that thought yeah, it, it's not smart enough at least as I understand it, it's not smart enough to understand the exact line of code it hit when it stopped. Huh. It only knows redo the line that it was last operating. So you get a little bit of moosh if you already got like yeah. a set three quarters or more of the layer there. So cross your fingers, it, it runs out at the beginning of the layer. <laughs> hmm. I knew the power resume did the whole layer, but I figured it's since very the moment run out doesn't turn off, that it would it's know exactly much. where it left off. Very much the same thing. They just have separate um, backend scripts, if you want to yeah. call them out, for how they handle it. So, like uh, you know, the um, the power off one, 
just records whatever the last it doesn't even record what's on the sd card because it it writes every line to the sd card that's why they eat sd cards with the runout sensor or the yeah. you know, the power up thing so every line it starts the second it starts to execute it it writes it right so if the power goes off when you restart it it'll have the last one you're working on right yeah that's how it recovers it it, it doesn't go Oh crap! I got thirty microseconds of power. Let me record the value. If they could do that, it wouldn't wipe out our SD cards. So if yeah. anybody wants to figure out how to write the code for that, get with uh, the folks at the Marlin Project because you could save a lot of people a lot of um, destroyed SD cards if you can work that out. Although to be fair, I've never burned up an SD card to print it. So no, <laughs> I I hadn't. Although I had one the other day that really bit me in the butt. I am. Um, I got in the Ender 3 Pro as a sort of a thank you for something I'd done for somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a user return. So it was a basket case. I get yeah. all together. Everything seems to work. It um, Home fine. Heated up. Bed and, and hot end fine. No thermos errors, Nothing like that. And I go to run a print and it just chokes. Mm. And uh, so I went and tried different G-code seeing if it was just the g code that was on there because i was using, trying to run code that had already been written to it yeah doesn't work finally get upset enough that i grab another extra motherboard i had hey rohan uh i don't know if you want to join us rohan but if you do um let me know and i'll send you a link um Ro rohan has volunteered to be my my editor in, in as much as he has time or whatever as i start to do my recording of all my um my own ver my own iteration of my help guide sections mm -hmm. and he's over in Europe so uh, anyhow uh, but yeah so longer story short put in another motherboard same SD card same problem mm. so then I put the original motherboard back in cut that SD card in half and went to printing on the thing that was no problem because it was a defective SD card. <laughs> yeah, that happens. That that poor guy, he had so much going against him, the guy that returned that one. So, you know, I'm not going to lie, Creality occasionally has, you know, uh, I don't know, what do you call it, a Friday printer or one that just doesn't come together well, you know? Yeah. And well, that, that happens. Particular, that particular one had sort of the miscut frame. It had the SD card that failed. And then... Uh, this part was probably more his fault than anything, but he had actually let, as he was working his way through trying to fix everything, he'd never, he was afraid to t t take apart the hot end because mm -hmm. there was like four, four extruder bodies and a bunch of other stuff. But when I opened that thing up and went to clean the, the whole throat assembly out and everything, there was, I kid you not, hard as charcoal burnt filament for eight millimeters through the heat zone where it just baked for days and days and days sizzy mm. or whatever. <laughs> so if you're having troubles with extrusion, it's not always the extruder. Sometimes you gotta actually take the hot end apart. I think that's one of the things I'm gonna address in my my beginner series is just explaining to people that they need to get over being afraid of the hot end. You want to be yeah. careful with it because it's hot in certain stages of dealing with it. And, well it uh, can't really hurt you. All it can do is give you a burn mark. Yeah, yeah, there's that, but they're just intimidated by it because it's behind the shield and and it's this mystery zone where things happen that, that they're afraid to touch. And somewhat rightfully so, right? I mean, you, you and I have seen, oh, Luke forgot to put, turn on his lights permanently. Give me a second. <laughs> but, uh, hold on. It just hit 100 degrees outside. That's that's my auto shutoff thing for my garage lights, so that the family doesn't waste the power all the time, right? Yeah. So uh, hey, it just hit a hundred degrees here. Oh, nice. <laughs> that's hot. Going back to the day. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, what we're talking about—the the hot end, being afraid to work on it. Um, there's a lot of people that damage their their thermistor by accidentally making contact with the heat cartridge and grounding yep. it to the block. And you do want to be careful of that. I'll get special attention in my segment that I do on that in my video series. I'm sure that if people look in your videos, they can find similar content. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's something you need to know. <laughs> but. You don't want the pixies going to the wrong place. Here, I didn't even see if Rowan wanted to, and I'm not, I probably saying his name wrong. I've only ever talked to him online, but I will send him a link really quick, just in case he wants to come in. Because this is nothing. Nothing super special for what we're doing today. And where is that at? Look for him here. New message to him. And there we go. So if you decide to join us uh, when you get into the lobby, um, because I'm not 100% watching it. Just wave your hand at the screen. Uh, the I'll probably see see you when you join that way. Anyhow, so is today a light construction day at your house? Huh? So does the construction slow down at your house? Oh, there's no one here today. Uh huh. A little too hot. <laughs> yeah. Even in the shade, 100 degrees is 100 degrees. Yeah, yeah. So, not the, I'm pretty sure I already did the 115 switch, but we're going to double, triple check here. Yep. That's my own personal rule. On new machines, you always, even if you think you've done it before, you always check the switch again before you... Test for white smoke. <laughs> eh, in the U.S., it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, just it's, a only, good it's only dangerous if you have 220 power. Absolutely. Oh, I don't know if people really want to see my face in this shot or not. I got a pretty good shot of the machine going. We're going to be mounting the quick release bullseye fan duck. So I... I think I talked about this the other night, but I'm setting it up so one screw is all that anchors it here, and this lifts over the other side. And what that allows you to do is basically lift it up and off to get out of the way so you can access the hot end without tools. Um, I got to get permission from Mr. Petzl to either give it to him and have him check it and put it on the main Petzl site or put it up as a Thingiverse listing if he allows it because it's his project or whatever i want to respect that i'm not just going to put it up on thingiverse and say well everybody can have it even though he doesn't yeah. care or you know it's not he can't stop me right being polite to another designer because i have well, what's there. the original license say this allow remixes i'm not sure but in my because i talked to him i'm friends with him i know in a couple cases he was very upset that people didn't even ask him before they put out remixes of it or changes to it and yeah. uh so out of the, the respect for the friendship, um, we're going to yeah. have that conversation, right? Well, it's something he might not be aware of. He has a set to allow remixes. There's no reason for anybody to ask that. He might want to go change that. Yeah. I'd have to go and check. I, I, I'm not sure. It's Dave Petzl is the designer. But uh, anyhow, but I find, I find the changes um, beneficial for working with because I can basically put the one nut or one screw in, put a jam nut on it to lock its head in place. And as long as you get yeah. the tension set right, it goes on, it stays on because all it is is fans, right? And when it's time, you take it off. Um, you do have to set it a little bit tighter because there's a version I have that actually has, it includes the BL touch mount over here as part of the print mm -hmm. and the other version. And uh, yeah. that one obviously because it's carrying the BL touch, you want to be really snug on it, but it still works. I have tested it. it. It repeats pretty well for taking on and off and not having a major shift in your Z height. So there's that. All right, so no white smoke. That's always good. You didn't murder it. And then I'm going to turn it off because i got to take the shroud off. And we'll see if that one screw is going to cooperate or not. I don't know what 
machine. I'm, I'm assuming I'm assuming they're using a um, one of those torque-driven machines or whatever. But whatever the torque value they have set for these case screws, mm-hmm. almost every single one of them. Oh yeah, the they're crazy is, tight. Uh, stuck. And uh, it's actually you know, one of the things that I've been trying to talk with them about working out in their manufacturing process is little things like that because. To you or I that know how to deal with it, it's not the end of the world, right? We know how to mitigate it. But you go you give this to, uh, you know, one of their customers might be a housewife that's not mechanically inclined. You've now made it in, inoperable to do basic maintenance on the machine. And we all know that at some point you're going to do maintenance on this thing. There is, it's not if, it's when, right? We got to get them to use the castle bolts on everything. Yeah. So putting it either a full headed cap screw would probably be the easiest. Cap way screw, to do it. yeah. Or, um, and I'd like to see them stop cheaping out on the screws and go with all hardened hardware. And then you guys get a hardened capture of so much better quality. Watch me curse as I try and do this with my my channel locks. What a strip! Yeah, it's already stripped. And it's already loose. Once you get it past the, the loose part, it shouldn't be too hard to get out. But, but yeah, it's just ridiculous. And for those that say Nipix charges too much for their tools with those pliers costing almost forty dollars or whatever, I would yeah. argue that they're worth every penny. <laughs> yeah. Good quality tools make a big difference. Yeah. I don't have every Nipix pliers they offer, but I have those little ones and I love them. You know, it's surprisingly good cheap tools with Stanley. Yeah, they they make quality They're home home high end what I call tools. high end cheap tools. Yep. Yeah, it's like you know, even like Harbor Freight, they have some good tools and some bad tools. It depends on which ones you get and what how hard yeah. you use this. Or but not. Hello, Michael. Oh. Rohan's here. I don't see a video from you, but um, we'll add you. I guess you can be on an audio. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Hi. Hey. We get a little, little of the EU accent. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Oh, I, don't know, I don't know that you've met Maurice in, the, in no. the groups or whatever, but he has a YouTube channel, and I. I've lost track of how many printers you've had. You've you've done what over 140 new printers. I have between 135 and 140 printers. I don't know exactly how many. Yeah. So um, <laughs> you want to ask a guy about a particular printer that he's had experience with? He's. I think you probably uh, of the people in the community. There's very few people I think that could touch how many printers you've touched overall. As a group. But. All cheap ones, though. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you get although right that flashboard guider too is really freaking nice. Yeah, yeah, but you know, you get right down to it. I, I think you and I both have shown that you can take a sub two hundred dollar Ender three without even doing any anything other than maybe some cap tube. And fitting, and produce prints that are as good a quality as those, you know, two thousand dollar plus machines, right? Oh, no question, no question. There's, so, um, there's largely no difference between them. Reality won won the race to the bottom with the Ender Three, <laughs> and now it's it's the backfill of what features can we add back and still get people to buy with more expensive machines that don't really make better prints. When people complain that it's a race to the bottom, and I tell them the race to the bottom is finished, and you know that's, we, that's we, done. We, yeah, we're already over <laughs> now. That. Yeah. Now they're seeing how much can they add to the printer without increasing the cost too much. Yeah. So this is the this is the golden age where you're going to start seeing. You know, look at the CR6 SE. This is where you're going to start seeing, you know, little incremental improvements to the printers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you see how tickled. Uh, uh, 3D printing nerd was over the fact that his 6 SC is putting out pristine prints with a stock profile and no modifications at all. Yep. 
and no, getting better. Yeah, I'm hoping to collaborate with him. He, I have an invite to talk to him about doing some stuff with my health guide and stuff. Mm -hmm. Not not to bash on him, but he is not the tech guy. He, he's not the guy no. you go to for tech stuff. No. And um, he's uh, his technical yeah, knowledge see. is almost non-existent. He's a uh, yeah. very very personable person. Yeah. He's a good personality. Yeah. Very likable. And I, you know, he knows the basics or whatever, but he, yeah, oh, yeah, you can tell he doesn't enjoy the mechanical part, and you don't have to, right? So, for some people, like I enjoy tinkering with them, some people they just want a tool, right? This is a tool to do something else, and uh, so everybody has their different way of interacting with them and their own comfort level of maintenance and whatnot, and whatever you want to see. The a one that kills me who's got both. The one person who has both personality and technical knowledge and is also successful would be like Devin Montes, make anything. Yeah, him or uh, Maker's Muse? Uh, Maker's Muse is more personality. Yeah. He understands the tech part He's, pretty He well. has technical knowledge. Yeah, he understands the technical yeah. side, but that's not where his videos go. His yeah. videos go for, uh, you know, like, like 3D printing nerds videos. Yeah. But Devin Montez does both. He has the technical know-how, uh -huh. and he also has that likable personality. Uh huh. Yeah, he he doesn't and present himself as being full of himself. That's his endearing quality. Yeah, and he does good stuff. <laughs> yeah, he's very creative. Like his little, um, what do you call those things? Um, the little snap together project he did. The, that oh, Astrolabicons. His Astrolabicons. Uh, no, I'm so there was. But he's what I call the artist engineer. Whatever those things were that were little panels that snap locked together. Um, I forget the name of it. But anyway. Oh, the um, I know what you're talking about. The little triangular mm -hmm. snap lock. Yeah, they could be triangular or square, but they're all geometrically designed and intended to be able to similar like Lego like flat panels type of thing. Mm -hmm. right. Normally, I'd look it up, but I got the internet. I need to find a, a good use for these things because once they come off, in my experience, they never ever go back on. Oh yeah, I've got loads of spare I don't use. So how? So uh, just so you know, Narice, uh Rowan actually won a CR10 S4, right? Yeah, that's it. Nice. And you also have a Ender three. And the free pro, yeah. Free pro, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, he's getting to know the bigger form factor 12 volt um, priority baseline printers. <laughs> Throw a one millimeter nozzle on that bad boy and have some fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm printing out some uh, Prusa face shields right now. And it's really difficult to get the um, PETG to stick on like the glass bed. I just uh -huh. find it really hard. Even when I dry it out, it like it still warps. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. Yeah. yeah, it's very subject to drafts and even cooling and perfect bed adhesion. And pet G is funny in that, like where PLA, I I, I hit that 0 0.24, 0 0.26 range for layer thickness on the first layer height. I find that pet G wants to be about 0 0.30 ish. Yeah, a little, little higher. higher. That seems to help a lot. P P E T G likes being dropped onto the bed. Yeah, and the, the hotter you can get and the slower you can go for the first layer is extremely important. I run on um, 255 Celsius with 25% cooling fan for my pet G. Mm -hmm. And my, I typically do 50 millimeters per second. My first layer is 30% speed. Okay. Yeah, one so of the, the biggest things I find people... Oh, sorry, Chris. Another trick is to use a brim and then keep your little tweezers handy to grab that first because it, it, PHTG loves sticking to the goddamn nozzle. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, I don't want to stick to the bed. I'd rather stick to the freaking nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> but once you get it laying down, that's good. Yeah. Once it's on, you're ready to go to town. But, but the other thing is, is people are like scared spitless to run their hot end up to 245 degrees to run it. And I run 255. Huh? I run it as hot as the hot end will go. I typically 250 or 255. Yeah, so I personally... People say, you're going to burn it. You can't be too. My, 
Who gives a shit? It's a, it's a consumable component. Just replace it. It's a dollar. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. What happened? Hold on. I don't know what happened, but my my Bluetooth disconnected to something that turned on my speaker. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> oh. All of a sudden, I have a, a wife, a Bluetooth enabled surround system, not surround, but a speaker system. And evidently, either I just bumped my phone or something and it picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, all okay. right. Oh, so the 245 degree thing, right? So if you go to CapTube's site, and this is specifically about CapTube's, not the cheaper junk. Um, uh, PTFE, but um, they say that other than being worried about birds that evidently have a particular thing that it lightly off gasses up to that point, you're good to 260 yeah. degrees for humans, no problem. And uh, they said you can go up to 280, but my experience is is because I tested it just for a little bit with a well ventilated spot, but you get up towards 280 and it degrades at a very very rapid point. Yeah. But 250, 255, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of hours before you have to replace it. Yeah, yeah. So um, my PTG is really weird because it says it says 200 to 220 on it for the PTG for the rating. So it's really weird. Like it seems really low. No, that no, it doesn't. That just means they stuck a PLA label on it. I, I thought I, thought I sent you a message on that. There's like a graph on the back. Some manufacturer stealing oh, yeah. other manufacturer's data charts because they don't know what they're talking about. They just grabbed the random chart off the internet and slapped it on there. <laughs> you, you'd like to think that your manufacturer wasn't that shoddy or whatever, but it happens. I wouldn't even try printing PTG below 240. Yeah, I run into people all the time. They're like, I maxed out at 235 and I'm having problems. And I'm like, just go higher. <laughs> oh, okay. That's weird. I'm just looking on the Amazon page now and it says 235 to 245. Uh -huh. There you go. It says, it says something completely different. Yeah. Welcome to Chinese manufacturing. <laughs> it's weird because it's worked kind of fine. It like it seems to print fine with it at that low temperature. Well, the thing is, is it'll get it'll you a, print, but it might not stick. It, yeah, oh, you'll have right. trouble with the first layer adhesion, and then you'll also have problems with if you get into a high volumetric extrusion, it'll yeah. temporarily not extrude well and then go back to it because it'll just the, the nozzle tip will get just a little cooler for a small period especially mm -hmm. if I, like on a really long wall where it's just laying it down heavy and long at the tail end of that you'll see little defects because the the heat available to keep it melted at the tip dips for a minute and um, <laughs> it'll give you these weird defects in your sidewall your part and you might get poor layer bonding too <laughs> Too low a temperature. Mm -hmm. Don't you hit it when that it's one, one on key that you want just disappears? <laughs> I might have to go slumming and get one of the non hardened ones out of one of these uh, provided printer packages if I can't find one in a minute. Or we find the other whole other set. I've got so many freaking. I gotta, I gotta loosen the belt <laughs> on this. So, how many of those have you done already then? So, two of them are basically 100% done, and this is the last one. Yeah. The only thing this one didn't get done on camera was putting the easy out thing in, which was just plugging into the board and running a wire out the hole. Mm -hmm. And then I put the firmware on, which. It was TH 3D Unified Firmware. Oh, I could yeah. complete, you know, put together the package of what he wanted for features. And then it took like five minutes to do all three of them. Just, I changed the name. Like this one's named Orange, obviously. The other one's named Blue. The other one's named Black. So they oh. each had their own custom name on the screen or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and then we uploaded them. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I got to loosen the belt. With The one thing with my, uh, my little slide on slide off deal on the ender five is at the um you won't even be able to see it in there but where the belt dog is to to latch in you it normally faces out 
I make it turn so it goes in and it'll actually fit in that slot, which is okay. And it clears the space for my my uh, thing to go over the bolt. Just a clearancing issue or whatever. Some some guy is going to say, oh, you changed the geometry and you're going to be dimensionally inaccurate even though the drive distance from here to here is on the other side, but we won't get into that conversation. <laughs> Well, some people don't realize that you could be technically correct while being realistically irrelevant. Yep. Cut off a little extra belt in. I may have to actually take the end roller off to get it in and then put it back on. Oh, it's the little micro things that drive you nuts. Yeah, for a New York minute, I thought this was going to be a rush session today because Matt contacted me. He's like, hey, if I manage to get into town on Saturday instead of Sunday, can you accommodate me? Which I was like, yeah, we can do that. I'm just there just to reduce some of the things that I was planning on doing. But then um, his wife reminded him that they had a lot more stuff to do to get prepared to even be here on Sunday than he remembered. So we're back to pick up on Sunday instead of Saturday. <laughs> uh -huh. What? Uh -huh. Do you know what he's using them printers for then? Hold on just one second. Your water. I'm, I'm focused on my uh, Sorry. belt tensioning. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? Do you know what he's using the printers for? Uh, it's basically for a battery adapter to use um, like a DeWalt or Milwaukee battery on a little electric powered bicycle motorcycle thing for kids. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. I, I wouldn't even talk about it, but he mentioned it on the stream the other day, and so the cat's out of the bag on that. So. <laughs> and, but, you know, it's a neat project or whatever, and he's got enough orders that he could justify with the pre-orders that he did to buy the three machines, pay me a little bit of money to put them together. He got me at a really cheap price. If you come asking about how much this costs, it's it's not going to be cheap. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as cheap as he got it anyway, and I'm not upset about it. I, I took this on knowing that I'd probably do it for free just for the fun of doing it. Yeah. So I just charge him a little bit of money to help cover time and material. Uh, marginally right like i like i could have gotten overtime at work today i wasn't going to work anyways but had i decided to work at work you know my overtime rate's like 75 bucks an hour so wow <laughs> basically he's paying about an hour's worth per machine for the three of them total right <laughs> but right that, now that's i'd be not, happy to make i can't i can't value my my time that way because it's not a business for me, right? Yeah, I just it's not how it works. Anything. So he, he will benefit from my wanting to have fun working on his printer, basically. And uh, everybody that comes looking that wants me to do it, I may or may not have the time. And, you know, you can call me a jerk for it or whatever, but if I basically well, don't like you when you approach me or whatever, your experience it only right? really it only really works with the local. Yeah. Because yeah, he's driving shipping that would cost like 130 from, bucks. He's driving from I think four or five hours away to come pick them up. Oh wow. He's getting three. So yeah. but like to ship that printer would cost you like a hundred, hundred and thirty bucks. Yeah, so I've recently had some clients have me ship them in and out. And my most expensive one was uh, Ender five Takes me CR10 S5, and that was the full machine. And that one to get it back to its owner was right around $150 from basically from Washington State to whatever state he was in on the East Coast. Yeah, ship postage has gotten insane lately. Yeah. Now I had a, a control box that came and went, and that was only the control box for a CR10 is only like 50 bucks or whatever. 
So to some people, seriously, then, fifty bucks to ship a control box? Yeah, it was a control box. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. Wow. <sighs> yeah, I think What's that not fair is that we're subsidizing all these manufacturers shipping. Oh, absolutely, we are. And you know, I don't want to start a big old crap storm over it, but um, they're you know, China actually made a deal with the U.S. Postal Service. No, 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 not even China. Yeah. I'm not talking about China. You're yeah. talking about last. You're talking about last mile. No, I'm yeah. talking about U.S. manufacturers and U.S. Yeah. shipping. I mean, look what it costs to get some stuff shipped off eBay or shipped off Amazon or mm -hmm. anywhere else, and then look what it costs you to actually ship it back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a lot of um, deal spinning going on there, and we're getting the raw end of that deal. Yeah. Yeah, the one guy I. I actually sent it back to him packed better, I think, than when he sent it to me. But um, it did actually get some minor damage on the return trip to him. I felt really bad, but um, you know, there's only so much in this world that you can control. Well, insurance is pretty cheap. Yeah. I bought insurance on it, but because it wasn't packed by the – because I sent it through UPS, through the mm -hmm. UPS shipping store or whatever, they yeah. said because they didn't pack it and they couldn't um, – they couldn't verify the feasibility of my packing that they would well, cover then they, loss. They cover then loss they, but not damage. Then they covered that it's fraud. Basically, the UPS store committed fraud. Pretty much. Because they sold you insurance that they knew they weren't going to be able to honor. Well, they could honor, <laughs> they could honor if it got lost. That it would get but that's it. not what it said. It says loss or damage. Yeah, I actually, I think I signed a waiver that said it was only for loss. Oh, oh okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, they would have to tell you, okay, if they did, that's different. Yeah. Okay. Yep. They, no, they Most know how to, they, 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 <laughs> they know how to cover their butt on that one, that's for sure. Yeah, well, well, no, that's fair. As long as you know going in mm -hmm. that damage isn't going to be covered, at least you're aware of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Looking very, very specific pair of pliers that I need. What did they do? With I thought that? they just sold you the insurance and it happens. Oh, yeah, we're not covering that. <laughs> no, when I, when I set it up or whatever, they made it really clear that that was what's going to happen. Although I do have to say, Amazon does a pretty good job of um, taking care of the consumer. Yep, I, I, bought a, I bought a heater, a couple of 700 watt radiator heaters. Uh huh. I like the idea that they're fixed at 700 watts, so you don't have to worry about people cranking them up to 1500. Yeah. And, um, well, the weld joints between the cells were shot, so they actually started leaking. Uh oh. And um, now they have a warranty. And what they don't tell you is that when you go to claim the warranty, um, right. you have to mail it back to them, and then you have to pay the shipping to get it back from them. Oh, nice. So you might as well just go buy a new one. No, literally. Not might as well. You literally, it's like, I was like, so you tell me I have to pay eighty dollars to ship this to you and ship it back? I could just buy another one for thirty five. <laughs> I was like, what's wrong with this picture here? I got to go grab a pair of pliers. I think my other son stole off my workbench. I'll be right back. Uh oh. <laughs> Skin him alive. Touch my tools, you die. There we go. I knew I wasn't losing my brain. I had them last night. <laughs> These are uh, an electrician's needle nose pliers, but I love those things. These are one of the most utilitarian pliers, especially for getting the... Um, the hot glue off of motherboards and stuff. You can get right yeah. into little tiny spots and whatever. So it sounds like Michael lost a plotter that got damaged in shipping. Hey, Dan. Dan was on the live stream with Crowdy last night, wasn't he? Or am I getting my people confused? Why wouldn't they pay? Go to small claims court and deal with it. Yeah. 
All right, so we got the those that are following along. I just mounted. I only put two screw holes for the fan to mount to the frame. It's a 4010 fan. It's not going to take off or lift off if it only has two screws on it. Yeah. <laughs> and then because of the design of the duct having a narrower gap than the dog ears on the newer Creality fans, because the newer fans are thicker, it's getting its dog ears removed so that it fits in the hole. It's not a big deal to function, but, but they get taken off. All righty. I got to get out. The crew is here. They actually showed up to do some work. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Ross. All right. I'll see you guys later. See you later, RC. See you. See you later. Hi. So make sure that I, I'm enunciating your name right. How do you say your name? Rowan, I think. Rowan? Yeah. Rowan, yeah. Does That's it sound it. more like a W? Um, It's with a H, so Ro Rohan. I don't know. Okay. When you said it, it sounded more like a, you were using more of a W sound in the middle, like Rowan. Yeah. I don't mind either. So it is an H, but it sounds W? Yeah, that's it. Roger that. Okay, I got to put the backing nut on that. So let me get my, I'm going to turn my volume up a little bit just so I can hear you a little bit better. Hopefully I don't get any feedback. Let me know if it starts reverbing back out. Right. I think we'll be all right. But that's anyhow. a really cool, that's a really cool um, what's it, uh, bullseye. Is it a bullseye? No, it's not. Yeah, it, that's the bullseye. Yeah, it's really cool the way you've got the clips on there, so you don't have to unscrew it or anything. Yeah, yeah. And if you want that STL, I'll give it to you. I, like I said, I'm not going to put it out in the wild or whatever until I got David's permission, but it's okay if you have it. <laughs> so what I do is I put, it's sort of a real booger to get it up in there, but I put the one screw in the back plate. Yeah. And then um, I put a jam nut on it so it's held at its location. You oh. sort of adjust the tension, lock it, and then it just slides on and off. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Nice. All right, here. Well, let's see if I can get the backing nut on there. That's been the biggest dexterity check of this job so far. It is, it is up tight in there. There you go. Nice. But yeah, the fun part is not just getting the nut to stay there while you sort of initially set it up. You have to get a hold of it to do the jam tightening too. <laughs> So basically, just put it on and off a couple of times to see what I think of the tension or whatever, and then hmm. then it's good. So you're pumping out those face masks. What's your your overall count up to the face uh, shield? I've done sixteen so far, and I've got to do twenty. So. I'm yeah, you did a whole another batch before that, right? Sorry? You did another batch prior to that, didn't you? Yeah, I did, yeah. I did 28 before some other people. Right. Yeah. So you're going to be up around 40 of them before the dust settles? Yeah. Like, since I did my initial 12,000 ear savers, I've done another two... Two or three thousand. I don't know. I've lost track now, but I, I'm still getting requests like once or twice a week from smaller, smaller batch requests. You know, wow. Can I get fifty or a hundred or? That's, that's amazing, that. Oh. No, it's a it's a real comfort item for the people that need them. You know. Yeah. Mm. And it's not really that expect. Well, it's not that expensive for you to make them, is it? Really, like. They, so my hard cost, that as near as I can tell, 
just by estimating power and everything and, and no money for for labor, right? Just for the hard cost for yeah. For um electricity and plastic is about a nickel a piece. Yeah. Not a lot. For those that are following along that want to save that last little cent on on making the ear savers, see my thingy verse for my thinned out design. It's 0.6 millimeters thick, so you can do 3.2 millimeter layers, or you can do 2.3 millimeter layers, and you know use a 0.4 or a 0.6 nozzle, whatever works for you. Because you can run a 0.3 layer with a 0.4 nozzle, you just may want to up the extrusion multiplier just a little bit. Yeah. But um, you know, if you're only doing two two layers per part and I have them set up to do um, sequential printing just in case something messes up on one of them. It doesn't take the whole batch out, but um, it goes pretty slick. Okay. So we got our frame mounted. It's doing its on and off. It's not going to fall off and print. Now we got to put this guy on. I had pre-done the screws coming through from the side there. Oh, yeah. I have to restock screws. I, I am. Um, oops. I should have fitted the other one. <laughs> oh, well, I guess I'm moving the screws over because I'm not taking that part back apart. But uh, anyhow. And those that are taking notes, as much as I love the pet spang, it is able to be broken. It doesn't happen often. But if you only have one printer, print two. Because it lets you get fixed before you can't fix it. <laughs> or you're sitting there playing with super glue, hoping that it holds together to get the next one printed, right? Yeah. I think there's a new Hero Me out, isn't there? I think it's version three. I think teachers yeah. advertised it or something. I I have mixed emotions about the Hero. Care of me or whatever. I've had quite a few people that have had trouble with heat creep, even with properly performing fans. And um, so I've just never really gotten behind it. Plus, it seems to be a little bit more difficult to pull off for the print mm. for some people. So yeah. I'll stick with the bullseye for better or worse. It's, it's what I know, what I like. I can print to a 70 degree overhang pretty consistently and uh, that's good enough for me. If it's over 70 degrees to get support. That's not that big of a deal, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other trick to this whole bullseye program is um, in David's original design, he pockets for three millimeter nuts that go into the frame. Um, I have deleted that out of this design because he puts uh, um, an Easter egg in his design. So the through hole into the frame yeah. is exactly the right size to use a four millimeter screw with no nut at all. And um, so you can put it on with the four millimeter screw and not even need a nut. It just threads into the frame. So. There's your Easter egg for the day. I thought the hole was quite like quite bigger than an M3 screw, you know. It was, and it's just big enough that you can self tap an M4. <laughs> that was that was not an accident, at least according to Dave when I talked to him about it. Anyhow, you know, all in all, I mean, it, you know, it, it looks a little distinct or whatever, but he did the flow optimization when he designed it, which a lot of the duct systems don't. Hmm. Uh, and uh, they just work. So if it works, I'm going to use it. I got sort of lucky. I, I did when I designed my, um, my duct that's for the CR-10S Pro, um, I didn't have the time or, or want to try and do the flow optimization. But it turned out where I can do a beautiful 70 degree overhang as as drawn, as drafted, without having to do any changes to it. 
So we just left it alone. I really need to set up a little impact driver with Allen drives on it. We're doing this stuff. Got to cut this project in half for time spent just by having a, having one of my impacts or electric screwdrivers set up with a nut driver on it. Building character. So how's the special disease situation over there? Oh, um, well, they're, they're easing quite a lot of stuff now. So we're allowed, I think, well, pubs are open. Um, so now swimming pools are opening. So it's getting, yeah, it's get, getting a lot more opened up. But yeah. still a lot of people just are staying at home, not doing much. Yeah, they're starting to open up things here, but they're they're already starting to walk back part of what their open up was. Yeah. Because uh, the you know, the case case counts are going up, not significantly, but it was bound to happen. I I have mixed emotions. So my son being in chemo, I was really happy with the way that they treated it because it helped us protect him during his surgery. But all in all, I think for the general public it didn't need to be quite so severe. You know? Yeah. All right. Yes. And then this just sits in the hole there, and then I put a zip tie over it to keep it from popping out of the hole. Probably do this with a rubber band too, but zip ties seem to work. If you do this while the fan's running, make sure you don't stick your vent, your zip tie into the hot end vent. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that. Oh God! A, a dozen times, right? Yeah. I wondered why you put a zip tie on there, but I think you need, the screws don't fit, do they, or something? The the flange of the of the fan duct is yeah. wider than the original cut groove that was allowed in the front. And, and they, I, could probably, I could probably go and redesign it and fix it or whatever, but. I really don't care that it has the zip tie on it. <laughs> it doesn't take much to stay in there, and it's got a pocket, right? So yeah, just it's fine. You notice I didn't kill the zip ties; they're just sort of there to keep it from not mm. falling off. I tried it for a while with no zip ties at all. And I went like a month and a half before the first time that the fan fell off. <laughs> but eventually it fell off. But All right, so here's the cool part about it, because you can sort of see that it's on right now, right? Yeah. So I need to do the hot end fix to this one. So when I want to access the hot end, wow. I can access the hot end. Nice. So right? cool. <laughs> Mine, I've got to be able to touch on it. It's very awkward getting like, the, the, Allen key, um, the Allen key through and to right. So I have a version that adds a BL touch mount right yeah. on the side there. So if you want oh. that one, just let me know. I'll get it to you. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, so it's a, actually it, it, whenever you set your firmware up, it's actually at the stock location for the metal bracket mount um, BL touch. I was oh, like, yeah. you know, if I'm going to do this, we'll make it easy for people to use. Yeah. Right? They don't have to go and do special offsets and crap. So, okay, what am I doing? Oh, I'm doing the hot end fix now. So here's where later on, if Rohan wants to do some editing, he can put in the um, timestamp <laughs> mark for when we introduced the um, doing the hot end fix on the printers. 
I don't think I'm going to have you do it. These videos are two to three hours long, and there's no, no reason to have to download them just to put in a couple of timing notes. <laughs> I suppose if I if I really got ambitious, I can rewatch them and just make some notes and then put timestamp notes in the thing without editing the video itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Is that using a silicone like sock in it? Or was it? Is it? it a, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the new blocks are anodized orange. I don't know. That's a new thing. I've never seen them orange before. And uh, that's fine. But whoever the the sub vendor that does it for them, because I don't think they do them directly. They have a vendor that does them for them. I noticed that. So this one is okay. It's got like a third of a turn off of being flushed out through the block. But the first yeah. two that I got, I could not tell if the nozzle was not hitting the block before it hit the throw. And so I just totally dismantled them and, and made sure everything was geometrically put together right. Have you got some new fittings on the PTFE fittings on them? It's just um, Yeah, I'm putting on new ones as I go here. Yeah. I got the BQ brand and... Um, like most of mine already have the the hot end picks already put on them, so oh, I'll just nice. take these ones out. And like this one, this one's the orange, so I actually did them in his color. So he'll have, his will have a, a orange colored insert. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so and it's got its own cut gauge, and each one of them is set up sort of independently or whatever. So if he decides to scale down and and sell one later, he can just grab all the same colored parts and send them on their way. Um, evidently, that one was put in there pretty tight. Okay. All right. So here we go. We got our orange. Orange fixed spacer. Yeah. Put it in there. Look, it's all pretty and orange. You like I say, teach in my instructions. Make sure that it's nice, loose fit for the filament coming through it. Yeah. Everything's good there. In this particular case, I usually heat the hot end before I take it apart because sometimes the plastic can lock the ptfe in but these ones haven't been having a problem with that so we'll just take that out and i got my cheater 10 millimeter socket for taking them off the old fitting and then we're going to take the six millimeter socket take the original um, Original nozzle lock. Yeah. I may have to heat this before I do it, but I'm actually taking it off cold to see how well they'd actually tighten it at the factory just for my own personal knowledge. Traditionally, I want to be at 250 degrees when I swap my nozzle. I want to see if they got it tight enough that it mattered. Nope, that thing was barely on there. Ooh. Are you going to take the two screws out for for the break? So um, I'm going to leave them in for his because I'm not doing the. Um, I don't have enough screws to replace the screw that goes in here. Oh yeah. But um, they're not. I mean, later on he may choose to do it, and I'll tell him how to do it or whatever. But I just I ran out of hardware to do it. Is basically what happened. So what we're doing now is. The heat block back set is supposed to be such that when this new nozzle goes in, that it does not hit the block before it hits the face of the throat, so that it, um, so that the when those two, this tightens to that, it holds the block in place. Yeah. I'm looking at that, and I haven't even tightened it yet, and there couldn't be maybe 0.3 millimeters gap, which is not enough. So what I got to do. To fix it is we'll just take the pliers 
and back it off, or excuse me, advance it about a quarter turn. I remember doing this when I had to install my E3D nozzle yeah. v version six. Yeah. It was longer, I guess, uh, yeah. Yeah. So now you guys won't be able to see it directly, but I have probably about a one millimeter gap between it and the shoulder, which will be diminished as I do the heated tightening. But essentially I had to move the throat back set half a turn so that it's properly going to tighten up so you don't get the throat leak that uh, sometimes people get and uh, whatnot. All right, so that's the all. Move this up out of the way. Go ahead and heat her up. Send her up to 250 degrees. Sorry guys, I haven't been monitoring the chat section very much. Somebody's put something on their hypercube. 3D Dan is gonna do a polymate thing, but that have to do it another time. Is that polymate that same manufacturer that um, 3D printing nerd just did uh, did a commercial on or whatever? I call it a video, but it was really a commercial, but he, he had, a, I think he had three vendors all in one video. He got Creality in, he got the two, two filament manufacturers in, and there might have been a, another sponsor on top of that. So he got three or four sponsors all covered in one video. So he's wow. looking pretty hard. <laughs> I just researched and Polymate, I think they they do 3D printed speaker drivers. Uh-huh. That's quite cool. 3D printed speakers. All right. Oh shit! I forgot. Oh, there's one side note with this these larger nozzles that I'm using. I don't know if you were here for that the other day, Ron. But um, I'm using these larger thermal mass nozzles that I found. Oh yeah. They're the same size as a CR10S Pro, but they have the coarse thread for for these trimmers. But um. The kicker to it is, is if you're putting these little retention screws back in, the these are actually assembly screws. There's a long going fight over whether or not they were intended to be left in the machine. Oh yeah. The original designer intended for them to be used during assembly, but not necessarily in use. But then once everything worked out, they went back and said, oh, well, maybe it's fine to leave them in there. I personally think that they transfer a minuscule amount of heat through and honestly, during normal operations, it's not a big deal. The only time it'll really affect anything is if your heat sink fan starts to not function as well. Mm -hmm. It will bring on the heat creep again a little sooner than it would have without them. So normal operation, yes, I agree most, with most people. Probably not that big of a deal. But when things go south, it goes south faster. Mm -hmm. That being said, they do add a little bit of overall strength to that area like if you crash into something like i don't like to crash into stuff but it happened yeah so we're at 250 degrees we're going to take our pliers and support the heat block you can also do that with like a crescent wrench just so the twisting loads aren't transferred up through the rest of the hot end and i'm going to take my my nozzle wrench I'm not going to kill it, but I'm going to get it pretty snug. And because we've tightened it at 250 degrees, and he's going to be operating at 200 to 235, you get a mechanical addition of compression in that joint so that it won't leak. All right, so the temperature is down. 
We're going to use its cut gauge. I haven't had any problems with the cut gauge. It's not cutting right, but I like to test each one on its own. This one's set up to use a 0.6 razor blade, like this style, utility blade. And if everything goes well when we cut it, it'll be somewhere between 31.2 and 31.4 millimeters long. Oh, I see you've got the dot. Is that the dot bit? BMG extruder clone there. Or is, what's that? Extruder. So that particular one is by a company called Creativity. Oh. Um, okay. This happened to be the one that he picked up. I actually have one from them that I, I got in just before he got his, but um, they're all pretty much, I, I hate to you know, demean the manufacturers, but they're all pretty much the same. Um, most of the most of the Chinese ones don't work quite as cleanly. So there we go. 31.2526. Perfect length. Despite popular belief, as long as you have the, a standard throat, and the standard spacer, that number is always good between 31.1 and 31.5. It doesn't change. The only time it will change is if you move your throat back set with the set screw further out of the heat sink. Hmm. That's the only time that that length would be need to be modified. And I'm sitting here trying that with my fingers when I know I've got an out there. Uh, I did that with two fingers. You just want it tight enough that it's not going to back up in use. And now that PTFE is well wedged against the throat by the bottom side of this and that spacer. And it will not, not have problems with the void that can form and cause under extrusion. And the side benefit is this PTFB here, other than maybe getting buggered here and needing a few millimeters cut off every once in a while, will not degrade um, over time. So you only have to replace what's in the hot end. Nice. I need to get some bad retractors and do like your arm for my CRT. Uh -huh. Yep, yeah. I have those on almost all of my regular machines, too. Nice. All right, so here's the fun part. Now we can put our fans back on. Oh, we're done. Hey, <laughs> I, I so enjoy that. <laughs> oh, and I guess we missed one operation. I got to put the socks back on. So it's not putting socks back on once it's hot. Okay, socks back on. Have all you right. printed all the parts out of PTG then? Or what were you using? Material. Um, all these parts that I printed for these were done in PLA. Oh, nice. Hmm. Um, the only thing that really will ever get affected by heat potentially, and I made extras for it, is the, the washer for the... For the um, the hot end picks. So yeah. it, in no, normal use, that will never see more than 45 degrees Celsius. So PLA is fine. Mm. The only reason it would ever, ever melt is if you get complete failure of your heat sink fan and it's on for like an hour plus with no fan on. Oh, yeah. That will melt. Yeah. To, uh... And if you do that, I don't care if you do it in PETG or whatever else, it's going to have problems, right? So, <laughs> Use PLA. They cost like two cents a piece. Make like five or ten of them. If you happen to lose one, you don't have to curse me over two cents. It's gotten so much more expensive now, though. PLA. <laughs> yeah, it's going up. Well, it's actually on its way back. So at the peak, it was like twenty-four to twenty-six dollars a kilo, pretty regular. And I'm starting to see it drift into that eighteen to twenty-dollar range. And I wouldn't be surprised if in another month or two, it's down back to that. 14 to 22 dollar range depending on hmm. what happens but i gotta harvest some parts 
<laughs> We're going to try a mid print change. So I'm harvesting these off of a Wham Bam PX plate on my Sierra Tennis Pro. And I really like it, but this was an early iteration. So it's 300 by 300 or 310 by 310, whatever. It's not quite the rectangular shape that my Sierra Tennis Pro is. But I just picked up partly because I love the texture on them. But I just got the new oh. Easy Easy Flex from TH3D with that sort of port. It's a rougher, I shouldn't say rougher, a more buried surface. So it's not really rough. It's just buried. Because I could yeah. definitely, I could definitely do one with my on my CR Tennis Four, but they're quite expensive. The height, the bigger they are. Yeah, they're, they're not giving them away. That's for sure. <laughs> It may seem like a little deal, but it really bothered me that I lost that 10 millimeters off the back of my bed <laughs> before. <laughs> so I have some other um, 300 class printers that that other flex plate will probably end up on. What's it called? Cool? Cool? I've got a, I got a G Tech um, A30M that I'm playing with that it might get it. I'm sorry, what's that? What's the, um, sorry, what's the uh, uh, TH3D? Uh, build plate called sorry they call it the easy flex his easy. whole so he has the easy easy out sensor he has the easy board he has the uh, he also has the tough series thing so it's, most of his stuff is either tough or easy right that's his yeah. market or whatever so it either makes it tougher or easier to work with but those are the easy flex sheets I oh, they do. They do a four hundred and ten by four hundred and ten one. Mm. That's actually I think so. yeah. They should have one set up the right size for this the four hundred series. If you measure your bed, it'll be the exact same dimensions. On the specs, it says four hundred by four hundred, but they leave a, a safety margin around the perimeter that if you change the firmware, you can go all the way to the edge. So, like okay. these are two thirty five. Excuse me, 220, 220, 300 normally, but it's actually going to be now 235, 235, 300. Mm -hmm. I think you get all of it. Let me double check. I, if if uh, Tim isn't doing it in the firmware, I can go in and fix it or whatever. But let's go to uh, control, or excuse me, prepare, new access. Actually, you know what? That's auto home because I don't know if I auto home, but since I turned it off. And this has the silent homing on it, so it goes slower, but it is way less violent and, in my opinion, more accurate than, um, oh, shoot. We're going to stop for just a second. Luke forgot that he hasn't set your, uh, set the um, height for the end stop for Z, <laughs> so it's going to come up and ram the nozzle. But we're not going to do that. And I also just remembered that i got to put on... The support arms that are printed. I don't know if you were on the other night, but you see how nice those turned out? Let's see if we can get a good picture on it here. Oh, wow. They look like they're injection molded to me. From yeah, that's camera. ABS done with the Ender 3 uh, wow. in uh, the Creality enclosure. The only other room, well, it has the BMG extruder and uh, my hot end fix, but those are only true quote unquote wow. modifications to it. Nice. But, you know, they look, they, like you said, they almost look injection molded. I mean, you can see some layer lines in them, but they look really sharp. And I still don't like ABS because it stinks, but these parts warranted putting the extra strength material on it. And it, honestly, they're, the PLA is more rigid, but um, it tends to um, creep more over time. I gotta take off the left right thing here. That's the left. Double checking. No, it's on there. Oh, there it is. Right. right. What is this one? Left. Right. The real fun part is I'm about out of hardware for this. So I what do we have? I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So he's going to be short three or two, two point 
two screws in this assembly. <laughs> I just don't have any more. It's all right. It will work okay, and he can add one later. Is assembly. Oop, that to that side. I'm probably actually going to put some screws into this and then I'm going to take it down, put the nuts on, and then put it back up because it's in location. It's harder to get them most of the way assembled. I even have mixed colored screws, so we got some stainless and some non-stainless. So we will try and make them evenly distributed so they at least look like they belong where they belong. I'm <laughs> gonna have to restock some hardware. Wow, is that all your hardware gone then? I was able to do all three of these with what I had on hand without buying new hardware. Oh. Again, I had already made an arrangement that at the end when I figured out what I needed for materials, I'll pay for them. So I'm not too worried about it. I just, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to use. And in essence, I'll probably basically end up buying one of those $15 hardware kits. Because yeah. That's about what I used. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been a fun project. Mm. Honestly, the tuning, tuning and setup, setting up the printers is probably most my most favorite part of these things. And it's fun making prints with them too. Don't get me wrong, but but um, of the overall experience, I enjoy building and making sure that they run right the most. Yeah, I like building. I like building probably too more than printing, and mm -hmm. um, modifying things as well, grading. And if you want hardware to go on difficult, just do it on camera because it always takes twice as long on camera than if you're not filming. The unwritten law of printing. And that one particular nut, it is a mother to try and get on if you have it up in position. But now that it's on, I'm gonna run it up. Put our brake brace in place. Tighten it up as much as we can that way. Another burger with that one is he didn't do a nut capture on it. And I think we covered with somebody the other day. There is a version, a remake of it that has nut captures in it. But if you take the right screwdriver, you can wedge it against the nut to stop it from spinning. And if you're doing these, especially in PLA, do not over tighten these because you'll get creep from uh, plastic deformation over time. And if you over tighten it too much, it may not even break at first, but you'll come back a couple hours later and it'll be broken. So <laughs> don't overdo it. I'm going to be a little bit heavy handed with these because they're in ABS and it's you can handle the deformation better. With PLA, you got to be really careful. I ended up redoing my PLA ones in ABS because I was just not happy with the way that the, the PLA ones worked out. 
And they broke. Oh. Did I not get a note on that one yet? So we got a little bit left on this one. We got to take the original magnetic bed off for the TH3D mag bed. His magnets will go up to 140 degrees without problems. And they have a higher gauss rate for the, the magnet not lifting up. They're not letting the um, plate get lifted up if your part's trying to work. Wow. That's the biggest thing. Now people say, oh, the strength of the magnet doesn't matter. It does. If, if you get a part that wants to work bad enough, it'll actually lift the lift the plate up and bend it. Even like, like especially with these um, these Creality, um, what should I call it? The um, stock mats or whatever. They they work great, but um, if you get something that really wants to work, it will let it. It won't stop the working. It just doesn't have enough magnetic force to stop it from lifting up. Yeah, I think when I got my PEI, I replaced. I had to replace it with the one that came. Mm -hmm. I think it just wasn't strong enough. It's always got to be one. It's getting difficult. I will say I, I do enjoy the fact that I can have multiple printers running at once. Because like if I get a big project, I can just add more printers and then they go. You can turn a 200-hour multiple part project into a, a two-day event. <laughs> <laughs> What is going on? Why did you not want it to stir? It's probably a burr on the end of that stupid thread or something. Wow. Okay, you're coming back out and you're going to explain to me why you're not working. Got a bunged, bunged thread. So I apologize for those that get the thing on the fingernails on the chalkboard effect when I apply this file to the screw, but you're just going to have to mute the thing for a second if you're sensitive to that. That's better than me having to go run and fire up my shop grinder. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if it'll start. work.
So with your face shield thing, have have you? I almost wish Nerys was still here because he could tell you a little bit more about it. But have you looked into trying to nest the parts where you print part on top of part on top of part? Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, I, that's how I do it. So I've got. They do like on the cruiser website. They do um, stacks of two and stacks of four. So I've been doing stacks of four. So on my S4, I can fit about probably. I could probably do all twenty. On the same print bed just with stacks of four uh -huh. at the same time but i thought i wouldn't do that but just because i've been having issues with the print like not sticking right. not sticking so I, I understand better to, better to minimize your losses if things aren't going smooth. always got to be one this does not want to play nice Almost there. Hey, we won. One lousy little ding on a thread can make your life oh. uncomfortable. Okay. I win in the end. See if I can pregress pre guess the height right in the bed setting. I've already done two of them, so I got an educated guess on about where it should be. Coiling up the excess wire from the easy out just because it doesn't need to be flailing about too much. Oop, 
I guess I had it right the first time. How have you hooked the easy out up then to the main board on the end of five? So I I got the the adapter kit from TH3D, so it basically goes in line with the um, support the cabling for the touchscreen. So um, you just basically unplug it, put that intermediate in. There's a separate plug-in for where the cord goes out to the sensor. And uh, it's pretty, there's no no tools involved other than the fact that you got to take the um, the bottom of the cover off to get at it. Yeah. There's more than enough room in the, the exit port here to get it in and out. That's cool. All right, so I guess next thing we can do is actually remove the original magnet. And for better or worse, I like to use a knife to cut it into strips because it makes it easier to pull off. You don't heat the bed up first. Because these are new and they've never been heated, uh, I'm not. But, um, yeah, with one that's been on and been through a lot of use cycles or whatever, I would. Okay. But, um, because these are brand new, they haven't had a lot of pressure put on them and uh, um, and whatnot. There's no need to, um, in my opinion, to uh, heat it up to get it off. Makes sense. You can tell this one, anyways, this one might prove me wrong, but up to this point, They've all been coming off with the 99% of the adhesive still stuck to the magnet, not to the bed. But this one is, of course, going to do its best to mess me over, right? And you guys, you guys can't see it super well, but taking a third of the bed off, it's way easier to fight the surface tension of one third of the bed than all of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a slight burr from the razor's edge touching the bed where I um, where I cut through the the surface. There's your one third strip. Oh, nice. But um, I'll I'll make sure that that's deburred before I put the new surface on. And we'll take a look. So of the two that I've done so far, one of them was good to go for flatness. One of them had a very, very minor dip in the middle, like 0.04 dip or whatever. And uh, that one I put a small piece of um, aluminum foil shim underneath of the bed to counteract it. And uh, it came out looking perfect on the, um, when I did the final check on it. Two down, one to go. There is definitely something satisfying about putting that new magnet, magnetic surface on, but getting the old ones off is never fun. And heat will cause the tackiness of the stuff to change, but you're more likely to get magnet separating from the glue than bed separating from the glue. There you go. So, and you guys aren't going to be able to see it, but at the very, very back edge, there's just a little bit of tiny glue residue. I'm going to take a razor knife and carefully excise it off of there, and then I'll take some uh, acetone to it just to make sure I got it all off. So.
And you, you guys don't have Dollar Tree over in the EU, do you? Uh, we have Poundland, but All right. it's probably we similar. Have a place called Dollar Tree, so I get the, get the um, nail polish remover, get yeah. the little pump dispensers there. Mm. And you got sticky stuff to get rid of or whatever. It works really good. Luke has a great filament holder, same that I use. Great design. It says tripod garage in the chat. Yeah, this um, I, I always want to call it the filler brace or filler brace or whatever. Yeah. You go to my my uh, my Thingiverse playlist where you can show off other people's stuff and collections or whatever. In my collections for the I think for all the printers that I have collections for, I list that as one of the suggested prints for new people yeah. and it works good about 98 percent of the time mm -hmm. and the other percentage of the time it's not it's really its fault but if you get a real lop scent eccentric weighted um, spool it can cause some issues where it overruns because it's it spins so smoothly mm -hmm. And if you don't have nail polish remover around, you can also use Goof Off or Goo Gone. And you can also use um, ISO, but I don't find the ISO works as well as the other ones. But they're all, all options. This one will get a, a round of ISO for making sure the new one bonds well. I love having ISO split bottles. Oh, yeah. The thing that's been sort of a bugger is, is um, for a while there, the isopropyl alcohol was hard to get a hold of. So mm -hmm. I ended up restocking with a 50% isopropyl from um, from the Dollar Tree store. So um, I have to give it a little bit more time before I start a print because there's more water to evaporate. Okay, I'll keep that handy because I'm going to do quick. Those that don't like things scraping against each other, close, turn your mic off or whatever, but I'm going to use this steel straight edge to make it sure that any burrs from that, um, the knife cutting of the magnet are removed. Either knocked off or pushed down. And I'm developing a uh, procedure for people for if they have a bed that's not flat when they're doing these flexible surfaces on how to um, set up to shim it yeah. and I'm pretty close I think but there's definitely some things you can do that won't work out for you that I've found over time trying to see how it is that other people are going to struggle with it now that bed is perfect if you want to check how flat your bed is, put a straight edge across it and put a flashlight to the back side. If there's any voids or irregularities in the surface, you'll be able to see it. Yeah, that that might have a 0 0.04 dip in the middle of it. And I could have even introduced it when I was pulling the magnet off, to be quite honest. Just this plate is strong, but it's not invincible. I actually think that one's small enough. I'm not even going to introduce the um, foil to it. But if you do need to use foil, there's that. 
this is just Reynolds aluminum foil from the kitchen or whatever. You can use it as a shim to do micro tuning if you got a little dip or something in the bed. <laughs> And for setting up these magnets, I, Tim's magnets seem to be less polar than than some that I've dealt with. Like some of the Crowley magnets are definitely stronger bonding one way or the other, especially when you're magnet to magnet. But I always try and see if I can see if one way's magnetism feels stronger than the other for the orientation to the, do you, the, the magnet. do you think the foil will work on a glass bed then? Or is it just for... Oh, yeah. You can put it between the this bed and the glass bed to take out a diff in the middle for sure. Once it's up to temperature, the um, glass will allow the support to work and flatten out. Oh. All right, this is the orientation it's going to go. This is always the nervous part for me because once this stuff sticks, it's a fair to get it off. And you see it's just a little bit bigger, so you get a micro micro error available, but not much. You have done the stabilization mod, haven't you? You done that yet? Um, I've done it on the other two. Um, we're gonna look here in a minute to see if I got enough nuts left on this one. But yeah, two of these I've already had the bed stabilization done where I add the nuts between the up underneath there. Yeah. It's in the plans for all three. I just don't, wasn't sure if I had enough um, nuts. Enough nuts. <laughs> Started adding up quick quick because I was using eight, eight per stabilizer and four. So I'm using 12 nuts per machine or whatever and so that's the 36 nuts that i to come up with and uh i have three sitting here and i bet if i dig really deep there's one somewhere in the pocket that i'm going to find that will get me the fourth one but you might hear me dig into containers before to find one so get me through until i can restock i do have some nylock ones but i really hate to put the nylock ones on there because um it's just really, really hard to get them back off. <laughs> but in a pinch, we could have the nylons this year. Got some five millimeters in here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> We have a winner. Hey. <laughs> we have enough to do the, the bed stabilization mod. And like I said, I already have the other three sitting here waiting. It was on my list of things to do to find the last one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really conflicted on if I'm going to get another assortment or if I just want to start individually doing batches of the ones that I most commonly use where I buy like a hundred or 200 at a time hmm. instead of instead of uh, a organizer where I use different sizes right so yeah. this one here this organizer here Let's see if we can get it into frame enough to see it so all the four millimeter nuts are gone I have one particular size of four millimeter screws that I don't use a lot of yeah. the smallest that one and that one those ones are all gone and uh, I don't know what it is but that length that is the 16 millimeter length I don't hardly use but I've used almost everything out of the three and four millimeters and all the other lengths mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> one of those things you know every, everything has its own niche of stuff it uses mm -hmm. And we will take the, normally I would trim the edges with it on because I was already ready to do that. But um, 
since I need to put the bed stabilization nuts on, I'll lift it up while I trim the excess magnet off instead of doing it the other way. And if you intended to remind me to do the bed stabilization where I had access to the head side of the screws before I put the magnet on, I appreciate that you did that. I didn't clue in on it. Yeah, that's why I said it. Yeah, that's why I said it. <laughs> Sorry. Normally, I would, like you said, you want to do, when you have access to the Phillips head, it's easier to get a hold of those screws to do the bed stabilization. But yeah. honestly, I can grab a hold of the shank of the, the um screws and still get it tight without ever taking that surface off so it's not getting to the world. But I definitely missed an easier trick, that's for sure. This guy's going to get a really good, well-working printer. That's for sure. Yeah, they, they've all got my quote-unquote Midas touch being applied to them. To be armed for bear. All right. So those unfamiliar with the bed stabilization mod, the reason that I'm putting these four millimeter nuts up underneath the here to um, to lock these screws perpendicular to their surface is you can get what I call trampoline movement um, between the screws and the upper plate because it's got a chamfer on it. So if you get a side load on it, which we don't get a ton of side loading, but you do get some, um, this stops it from being able to do that uh, pivoting off of the chamfered surface of the head of the bolt because it's only being held there by spring tension. And once you override the spring tension, then, then it can move, right? So by doing this, there is no way it can move in that axis anymore. And uh, just that's why you call it bed stabilization, because it stabilizes it. And it's pretty inexpensive. It costs you four regular traditional nuts. And when I do my video, I got to be very clear that you only need regular nuts, because in my uh, written guide, I say four jam nuts, and everybody and their brother is running out and buying um, nylock nuts. And then cursing me when they're a pain in the butt to run them on these super duper long screws to get them on. <laughs> like I didn't say nylock nut. If I meant nylock nut, I just said nylock nut. But anyhow, so in the next revision of the help guide, it will say use plain four millimeter nuts. <laughs> I don't know exactly when that's going to come out, but hopefully in the next two or three months, I'll be able to get enough time to, to do the rewrite. I've got some new chapters to add. There's going to be a back and forth. i got a videos to, to record and the content to add. And um, they gotta, they got to match each other, right? So I always have to do the rewrite before I film the videos, or at least before the videos go into post so that Rohan can appropriately mark them when they go up. Display. For those who didn't catch it, Rohan, at least for now, until he gets tired of me, has volunteered to help with um, doing my video editing uh, when I go to do my help guide series for my channel. The other thing with this is when you put it on is be careful there is underneath of that black film or coating there is a copper trace that is the actual heater of the heat bed and you do not want to 
break or damage it with your pliers while you're doing this. That would be a travesty, and you'll be cursing me because you have to go buy a new bed, even though it really wasn't my fault. And I like to check to make sure that the springs, or the, the screws go through the holes without the springs uniformly so that you know if there's going to be any hang up as you're operating the drive screws. And the screws will actually auger their holes out a little bit if they're a tiny bit misaligned. But you don't want it to be binding up so bad that when you go to try and adjust it, you're turning the wheel and Nothing is moving until then it moves a bunch because it doesn't have free movement through the holes. In this particular case, I'm just sort of using the sides of the screws to help make this run a little bit smoother. On some machines, when it's really bad, I'll take a 3 16th drill bit and just open the holes up to make them a little bit bigger. That gives you a little bit more more room and because you've done the stabilization that you're not so worried about lateral movement anymore. Okay. What other things have you got off of this to do then? Not in with the printer. What I was left to do? Yeah. Um, basically, after this and bed leveling, uh, it's on to actually test print with it. Nice. I don't think I have any mods left to put on. There's no more goodies arrived. I think I'm still supposed to be getting. We I we forgot when we were ordering that it already had the blue cap tube on it. So we ordered three me three meters of cap tube with fittings. And uh, I'm hoping the fittings come in just to replace my stock because I use my own fittings to replace them or whatever. Mm. But, um, well, it's not a huge deal. There's only three fittings that I've replaced straight. Yeah. Still. And the other fittings are on the Montex, and I'm not replacing those. Those seem to have a decent metal tooth um, catch on them, so should be all right. I remember in mine, the metal teeth just just quite low quality and it just came out as soon as I tried removing the PTFE. Oh, metal no. teeth literally just came out. I had to screw in a coupler like, into it. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, quality couplers is important in this system. All right. So I have a something that's not in my guides that I do, and part of it is because I have really strong hands. But I'll actually pull this down until it it's the springs are fully compressed. Yeah. And then I let it off just a little bit, and then I'll just drive the screw up really easy. <laughs> A little harder with the back ones with the other thing on there. With these arms in the way. Okay. No, no. Because I, I don't want to ruin his brand new TH3 mat if I miss the Z offset or something. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm doing the bed leveling with the original mat on it, which still works with the magnet, so he has that as a bonus. Nice. And of course, I forgot to put the um, or do the magnet trimming on on it while I had it up. So we'll do it now. Oh, excuse me. I just use a little razor blade and shred it flush. It's not even a huge deal that the magnet hangs over, but I like to get it off because if it's hung over just a little bit, if you happen to pull across the edge, you can lift an edge up and yeah. 
then you get sort of balled up gooey glue in the corner that can actually have a minor effect in that one corner of the, the height of the bed. Just better to get it trimmed nice. Oh, you know what? I put that new mat on the Sierra Tennis Pro, but I forgot to um, about to print more parts. <laughs> then they're making noise for no reason. What happened there? Oh. Something got underneath of the magnet in that corner. Now don't be in a rush to uh, mash those things down. And like you saw, because it hasn't been heated yet, I was able to carefully lift that corner up. But there was definitely, I could see there was a little piece of debris of some type that gotten on there, even though I'd gone over it with the isopropyl alcohol and stuff. Wow. And it probably wasn't enough to be more than a minor annoyance if you happen to put in this corner, which is the least likely to print place. But we want to be able to use all of our bed, right? Yeah. Without restriction. Have you thought of any better solutions to attach a glass bed instead of using binder clips? Like, because they take up the edges of the print bed and you can't use obviously the whole thing. Yeah, hold on just a sec. I'll show you what I'm doing. Go to the craft store and get the double sided tape thing like this oh the only thing you got to know about this is if you use this to put your bed on when you go to remove it you're probably going to have to take a piece of like dental floss or something and use it like a little saw to saw out the glue from wow. in between <laughs> but that's what i i got tired of crashing into binder clips on my uh, ender 5 plus so it got the glue or not the glue but the double-sided tape oh that's a cool idea yeah i'll have to do that Nice. And that's one of those ones that I sit there getting heartache over whether or not I share it with the community or not because um, somebody's going to do it and then break their glass trying to get it back off rather than blame me for it. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm just going to have to get a thick skin for some of these things or whatever and just put it out there. But. <laughs> Everybody wants to be liked, and people don't like you when they damage their stuff and get upset with you. <laughs> well, I'm probably going to have to go now, so. All right. Well, thanks for hopping in. I am. Warren, it was good to actually get to hear what you sounded like, and uh, <laughs> wish you were doing some, some work with you here as yeah. Get my head out of my butt and start making some videos. <laughs> yeah, it's 11 o'clock where I am, so. All right, yeah, get some sleep. Uh -huh. Thanks for stopping in. Yeah, all right, thank you. All right, bye. Bye. So, other than doing the bed leveling on this, which anybody that's familiar with 3D printing knows how to do, that pretty much completes the build portion of building three printers, three Ender 5 Pros from sort of start to finish with all the mods. So maybe as a wrap up, I'll go over everything that I did just briefly, and then I'm going to probably shut the video off. And then uh, I, don't, I might do a live stream later just to goof off or whatever, because it's fun. 
but it won't be directly tied to the series of uh, assembling and modding these printers. So um, I don't have a, a cheat sheet to go off of, so I'll just sort of go through the things as I remember them, and we'll cover what happened here. So um, the final wrap up. So what what do I like to have on a printer that's going to see use in my machine? Uh, no, no, no problem, tripod. I just was putting it up for something to do. No offense if you take off. So, um, what did we do to this machine? We started off with making sure it was square as we assembled it. Um, I did not do any mechanical adjustments per se. Then um, we made sure that this X Y gantry was squared to the mainframe. We've set the eccentric wheels on both sides of this gantry and the eccentric wheel here. Then we aligned the Z rod from one rod to the outer frame. And then we loosened the other one and did an exercise where we ran it up and down and made them parallel. That's most of the quote unquote kinematics tuning or whatever. Um, we did lube the Z screw with um, PTFE lube and got most of the stock grease off of it because I like the lube better than the grease. We did add the lube to the linear bearings and ran them up and down vigorously with the lead screw off to sort of get, get the stock grease out and then the PTFE lube into those bearings. And uh, that's all the mechanicals. Then what do we do in components, either purchased or printed? So we purchased the filament runout sensor from TH3D, the easy out system. It has an adapter board that goes to the motherboard in between this and the, the motherboard. It has a dual feature in that it actually takes the power from the speaker to drive it. So you don't have to do your speaker delete. The speaker will no longer make sound because that pin is no longer carrying through the transfer board. Something to note on that. Um, then um, I put TH3D Unified Firmware on there. Uh, if you want my clip notes of what I like to do in his firmware, that's all uncommenting when you put it together. So we did the base Ender 5. We did the new Ender 5 selection because it's got the 800E step Z screw. We did the easy homing so it travels slower into the home end stop so it doesn't beat the crap out of the carriage and the micro switches when it homes. Then we did, um, I gave them the option to do the manual mesh bed leveling because we don't have an ABL on here, but if he wants to do a full bed mesh, he can. It also, in that same firmware, has the four corner leveling. So it levels the four corners and you get a look at the middle to see how they paper touch off or with that uh, mesh bed leveling you do I think it's five points across on a five down so 25 point grid where you basically take it to touch off it records the z height and creates its own map manually instead of using a probe sensor to do it so you manually adjust the control to do the touch off at all the points and as long as you do a good job of that you'll have an equivalent mesh that you would if you used an ABL system um, it is a little subjective because you're doing paper to do it or whatever, but it does work. Okay, then uh, we did the wire looming. Uh, almost everything I loom, I loom up the back core here so it can be attached to that so it's not out to get snagged too much. There's a special um, hole put in for wire clamping here so you don't get wire fatigue where the solder joint is on the bed attachment. There's another special attachment hole here where we attach the ribbon cable to the XY that has a zip tie and it keeps it from pulling on those as it goes through its motion. We added a badge retractor here to take up the slack on this so that it's not hanging in the breeze and getting caught up on something like this in its travel or whatever and causes problems. Um, uh, going into the printed mods or whatever, 
We've got my upper support arm you can find on Thingiverse at L3D underscore help underscore guide as the user. Um, it helps to give a high point to support the wiring. We separated the wire from the PTFP. The PTFP should be able to run free, not attached to that, so that it can get to its most advantageous angle when it's driving the filament. In my opinion, that's the best way to do it. Um, there's more than enough wire for it to go to its furthest travel without getting hung up uh, by going this way. So we'll take it all the way out. We'll go out this way and this way. So it can go to full travel and the wire's not overstrained or anything. It's still got support. Um, other printed mods that we did. We did the bullseye fan duct with my personal mount system that I'm hopefully going to release to the public soon as long as I get David Petzl's permission. Um, I printed the hot end fix materials, which includes these little clips for the push-pull things to lock them. I printed the spacer that goes in the hot end fix system, and I printed the cut gauge for cutting the length of PTFE that goes inside the hot end. Uh, we replaced the fitting on this side because this these the stepper came with its own fitting. So we replaced the fitting on the head side for a metallic tooth BQ brand fitting that works really well. Um, then we printed the filler or filler brace unit with the um, Ender, or excuse me, Creality Series bracket parts that allow this to come on and off. It bolts to the stock bracket. It has the two 608 bearings in it, skateboard bearings in it, that allow it to spin pretty freely. Then we printed the back cover for the um, control box so you don't actually touch your fingers electronics and screw up the control electronics or get shocked. And then the very last print, I think, of the series that we did was this, um, and it is part also a mod, right? So we took the TF to full SD card extension that goes into this print. So it's inserted into there. It's got a little ribbon cable tree where you can put a zip tie on it to catch the ribbon cable, but it holds that mount. So you've got your your um, media in a nice thing here. You're not going to wear out the TF reader on your motherboard prematurely from in out, in out, in out. Um, you can even do this one, use this one if you decide to do Octoprint or whatever, you just use the provided hole there to get into the um, serial port and it can still operate. And this is just here for decorative or if you go off of Octoprint to use. It also has a thing for storing um, the TF cards here. It holds the full size and the miniature ones. And you can use the full size card adapter with the minis, miniature SDs, if that's the way you want to go. And there's so there's two miniature slots, two large slots for that. And was there anything else? Um, I think that pretty much covers the work that we did. Um, I will go through and manually bed level this pretty doggone close. And the thickness between this mat and the TH3D mat is a difference of, did I figure out what it was? It was point, point 0.8 millimeter or point oh eight millimeters difference or whatever. So when he goes to do um, the leveling for his is easy flex smooth PEI sheets. Um, all I have to do is a minor adjustment to the bed screws and it'll be good to go. Um, so that's about it. I know that this wasn't a super fantastically organized or, or uh, put together process, but I thought you guys like to see a little bit of behind the scenes as I go through and work on some machines. So everybody have a good day, and I'm going to sign off. I may sign on later today just for screwing around in the shop time or whatever. I won't put that on the um, Creality official site for announcements. So if you want to see it, look for it here on LH3D Help Guide on YouTube. So everybody have a good day. I uh, hope you got to know me a little bit better, got to learn a few things about tuning, uh, tuning the printers up and whatnot. Oh, I didn't specifically mention it, but we did the bed stabilization that we just finished.
as well as part of the upgrade along with putting the TH3D map. So that's all. Have a good day. Talk to you later.